Week by week, we've been going through attributes of God, and I hope they've been informative. And I hope that they've moved you to worship God more fully and to serve him more day by day as we learn about God and he puts some of these qualities in us. Some of the attributes of God are well-known and well-beloved. Even non-Christians will like to talk about the love of God. But today, we come to the most unpopular of his attributes. It's that serious one called the wrath of God. It's actually hated by many people. Some people will ignore it or deny it, and they'll say, why don't you preach on something nice? Some people have even been known to walk out of sermons on this subject. Have you ever heard a sermon on this? But I mean by someone other than me, because I have preached on this. Have you ever talked to someone about this subject? How would you describe it? I do not apologize for it, nor should any of us. Sometimes Christians are a little embarrassed by this when we talk about it, and we'll say, well, I wish it were not so. Don't ever say that. Don't ever think that. Are you holier or wiser or more loving than God? Would you have God be other than he is? All of God's attributes, including this, are his perfections, and they reveal his glory. Now, this doesn't mean we gloat about his wrath or have glee in it uh, when we see some non-Christian die. But rather, every time we think about it, such as this morning, we should have a very holy seriousness in our hearts. This message is summed up in this sentence. God is angry at all unrepentant sinners. And will one day let loose his holy wrath on them. Week by week when I cover the attributes of God, I frequently uh, will read out a list of some of the verses that talk about that attribute. If I were to do that today, I would be here for a long time. There are many, many verses and many different words for this. It's called the wrath of God, his anger, his indignation, his rage, his fury. One uh, reputable Bible scholar counted up 580 times in the Old Testament alone that mentioned the wrath of God. He also counted up 20 different Hebrew words for this. Now, Another scholar pointed out that's more times than the Bible mentions the love of God and the mercy of God and the kindness of God combined. doesn't mean that one or other of the attributes is more important. They're all true. The wrath of God and the love of God are both true. We cannot pick and choose. And you cannot truly appreciate the love of God until and unless you have appreciated the wrath of God. Perhaps that sentence will make sense to you by the end of this message. Anger is a strong emotion, and it needs expression. Just like other emotions, we, we, we grieve, we want to weep. Now with us, when we have strong anger, it's usually bad anger, and it's wrong, and it should be suppressed. But with God, this strong emotion is always good, and God waits for the time when he will express it and vent it at the target of the wrath of God, not sinners. What am I saying? God is mad. He is fighting mad. And he threatens his enemies with holy vengeance, and one day he's going to do something about it. God has several reactions to sinful man, according to the Bible. Early in the book of Genesis, it says God looked out over man and he was grieved. He was saddened for them. 
Then the Bible also says God is offended by our sin. His honor has been insulted. The Bible also says that when God sees our sin as it really is, he's disgusted by it. Think of something that really repulses you. Something that turns your stomach and you say, get that out of here. You have never been revolted by anything as much as God has been revolted by your sin. The Bible also says God hates our sins and he hates us in our sins. Often, here's one, God hates all workers of iniquity and that's us. And then the Bible also says God loathes our sins. That's a combination of disgust and hatred. But overwhelmingly, the reaction the Bible lays down is that God is angry with us and our sins. That's the wrath of God. Now, that doesn't mean God loses his temper. We lose our temper. God has perfect self-control. Bible, for example, often says God is slow to anger. Isaiah 48, 9 says, For my name's sake I will defer my anger, and for my praise I will restrain it from you. God has power over his wrath. In the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk prays, O Lord, in wrath remember mercy. In mercy God tempers it temporarily. It's a holy wrath. And whenever we think of the wrath of God, we must think in terms of His holiness. And when we think of His holiness, we think of His wrath. It's His holy hatred against unholiness. It's God's wrath against all that is against Him. And as I said last week, in eternity past, within the Trinity, there is only holiness. Since there was no sin, there was no wrath. The wrath of God is God's holiness Exploding against sin. The wrath of God is simply an extension of the holiness of God. And in eternity there was no sin, but when the first sin occurred, it was like, bang, God's holiness kicks in and blasts forth. If God was not angry at sin, that would mean God is not holy. But God is holy, therefore God is filled with wrath. As I said last week, it's like pouring gas on the fire, and then there's the fire that ignites the dynamite. That's the wrath of God. To the degree to which God loves holiness, he hates and is angry with unholiness. It's righteous indignation. Now, with God, it's always righteous, but not usually with us. We get angry. But it's usually not righteous indignation. You remember Jonah in the Bible. He was angry. And God says, why are you angry? And he says, do not I have cause to be angry? Well, he didn't. And that's the same thing with us. Sometimes, however, we do have righteous indignation. We read something in the newspaper, see something on television, and we roll up the newspaper and we say, that's not right. That person ought to be punished. And that's right. That is righteous indignation. But God always has righteous indignation. God is angry with man. And deep down, fallen man is angry with God. Oh, people will deny it. Oh, no, I'm not angry with God. You'll find out when you tell them about the wrath of God and God's punishment, and then they will get angry. Other people get angry with God when... Something happens in their life that they don't like. And they blame God. They'll shake a fist. And they get angry with God. Maybe something happened or they didn't get what they're praying for. Some affliction or something like that. And they get angry at God. Are you angry at God? Sometimes it's like when a parent punishes the teenager for doing something wrong and says you can't go on that date. You can't go to the fair. You can't go to that football game and not... Teenage son or daughter gets angry and says, you're mean, that's not right, and I'm angry at you. Angry because of the justice that the person brought upon himself. We get angry with God, and it's never right. God is angry with us, and it's always right. We deserve it. God is far more angry than we ever get. 
And God is always righteously angry with us. We are never right to be angry with God. And God is far, far more angry with you than you have ever been with anyone in your life. Even in your unrighteous anger. Think of that temper tantrum when you threw yourself on the ground as a little girl kicking and screaming because you didn't get that certain candy or something. Or road rage. You're driving and someone cuts you off or something and you say, oh, I'm going to get out and teach him a lesson. We've all experienced that. Or other cases of anger. You have never experienced even one millionth of the anger that God has for you. Now, today I'm going to use strong language taken from the Bible. You might think I'm, an exa- I'm exaggerating it. I'm incapable of exaggerating this. This is infinite, eternal, holy wrath. It's vehement. The vehement, uh, vehemence of God's wrath is in direct relation to our sins. And therefore, also, the wrath of God is in perfect proportion to the punishment that sinners deserve in hell. What am I saying? Both, among other things, what I'm saying is God is dangerous. Now, we've come across dangerous things. Electricity, a certain wild animal, poison, and we try to keep our distance. You know, they teach mail carriers that there's some ways you can pacify a dog, you can throw them a little treat or nice doggy, but then they also teach them there's some dogs you cannot pacify. You have to run, jump on a car, climb a tree. You cannot tame it. You cannot tame God. He is dangerous. He is not the wimpy, tamed godling of most churches. And you cannot pacify his holy wrath against you by anything that you do. None of the things that we experience in this life are nearly as dangerous as God. Don't trifle with God. You are in more danger than you realize. Don't trifle with his holiness. Don't ignore his wrath. It's been said that God is the best friend you could ever have, but he's also the worst enemy you could ever have. And if you are still in your sins, the Bible says he is your enemy, and it's mutual. You are his enemy. Let's look at a few verses on this. First, let's turn to the book of Romans, chapter 1, and then chapter 2. In chapter 1, verse 18, it says that certain attributes of God were revealed in nature through creation. Verse 20, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, undeniable. Verse 18 says the wrath of God is one of those attributes revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Through general revelation, God has shown something Of his wrath. So everybody senses it. That's why even in pagan religions they have some concept of an angry god or goddess out there and they try to pacify it. It's all mixed up, but at root they realize there's some god that's angry with us. And God shows this anger through earthquakes, floods, lightning, thunder, and other things. Therefore, chapter 2, verse 1, you are without excuse, whoever you are. You know that there's a God. You know he's holy. You know you're sinful. And you know deep down in your conscience he is angry with you. Now look especially at verse 5. In accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You are treasuring this up. Sin is the precious treasure that we store up like a miser collecting gold. But according to the Bible, sin has a price. For every sin we commit and that we treasure up in our hearts, we are treasuring up that much more of God's wrath against us. The NIV renders this, you are storing up wrath against yourself. 
It's like people say, well, you save up for a rainy day or you save up for retirement. That's what we do in our sins. Every time we sin, it's as it were, we're storing up one more uh, measure of God's wrath against us for the day in, we, in which we will suffer it. Job 26.13 says, The hypocrites in heart heap up wrath. The more sin, the more weight. And the longer you wait, the, lo- the stronger it gets. I heard a story some time ago about a, uh, a man that was very miserly and he saved up his money and he had transferred to gold coins. And he did this for years and years and he, he didn't trust banks because he had lived through the Depression and saw banks close. So he says, I'm going to keep it and I'm not going to bury it in the ground. I'm going to put it in this chest in my attic and Every week he'd take his paycheck, transfer it to gold, go up there and put it in. He'd sit around with a candle and, and just look at this. Money, 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 gold, it's money. He'd been treasuring this up. And the chest got bigger and bigger. And it was in the attic. Right above his bed. And one night in his sleep, it came crashing down on him and killed him in his sleep. What he thought was treasure was only storing up his own death. That's a good picture of what we do. We treasure up our sins and we think we can get away with it. But for every extra sin, there's one more measure of God's wrath that will come crashing down upon us one day. Or to change the metaphor, it's one more log on the fires of hell that we ourselves are storing up. Now that's what we're doing in the meantime. What is God doing in the meantime as he is waiting? Turn with me to another verse back in the book of Psalms, chapter 7. God is not just simply looking on nonchalantly, though he is reserving it and restraining it. He is also increasing in his wrath and he is preparing for the day in which he will release it. So look at chapter 7, Psalms. Some very holy verses, starting at verse 11. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. I would also add every night. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. What is God doing? He's sharpening his sword. Like an old-fashioned butcher that is chopping the sword he's going to use to cut the meat. That's what God is doing. And every time we sin, God says that's one more time. God is sharpening his sword for the slaughter. also says he's making the arrows ready. I used to go hunting, and a few times I went hunting with a bow and arrow. You know those kind of arrows that have razor tips. And it's very sharp, and it'll go right into the deer. But that's a picture of God's error that's sharper than any razor. And God's sharpening, as it were, his errors. It says here he's preparing them one by one by one. And it's as it were, he pulls back on the bow of his justice and he's aiming the errors of his wrath directly at the hearts of every unrepentant sinner. And God never misses. We're right there in the middle of his bullseye. Job 19.29 says, Be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know there is a judgment. It's hanging over us at this very moment. People will laugh and say, I don't see any sword. If you could see it, the judgment that is hanging over you, you would be terrified. Jesus said so. John 3.36, he said, The wrath of God abides over those that do not yet believe and obey. Back to Romans chapter 2, verse 3, it says, There's no escaping the judgment of God. Verse 16, it's stored up for the day of wrath. Verse 9, it says, The day of wrath and indignation that will one day come forth. And as it says in in verse 1, there's no excuse for anybody, Jew or Gentile. Ephesians 2 says, We were all children of wrath, like everybody else. Now, though everybody is under the wrath of God, (coughs) some have stored up more wrath than others. 
Some have simply stored up more sin or more heinous sins. For example, the elderly may look, oh, they're nice and sweet, but if they're still in their sins, they're simply old sinners that have more sins than children do. The wrath of God would be more severe on them than on the young. But wait a second. The Bible says even children have sin. We are born with a sinful nature and we add to it. Even these young children here today are under the wrath of God. Then there are other types of sins. Religious hypocrites deserve more wrath from God than rank pagans and atheists. Why? Because the Bible says hypocrisy of a religious nature is worse than just rank sin. God has a special wrath reserved for false prophets and religious heretics in the pulpit. And then more uh, worse than that are the sins directly aimed at Jesus Christ. When people make fun of Jesus or they laugh about him, tell stories about him and jokes, when they reject the gospel, when they giggle at communion, when they trifle with holy things, taking Jesus' name in vain, God takes special note of that. You see, a sin against his law is one thing, but when he says, you've sinned against my son, that ignites a special kind of wrath in God's heart. And yet, even the smallest sin, whatever it is, deserves more wrath from God than we can ever imagine. God is angry with everyone. Psalm 711, God is angry with the wicked every day, and that's us. God is angry with everything in lost sinners. Just like He is angry with everyone, He is angry with everything in each sinner. Because sin infects our whole being, therefore God is angry with everything in our whole being. Our body, our mind, our emotions, our thoughts, our words, our deeds, what we do, what we don't do. Our personality, our appearance, our very nature. Even our pretended good deeds of religion, like prayer, for the lost sinner, everything about him deserves the wrath of God. And it's like God looks at that sinner, everything about him, and God knows everything about him, and he says, everything about that person I detest and I'm angry with. Everything. Psalm 7 11 says God is angry with the wicked. And that's personal. It's a personal Hatred and anger, person to person. God has been personally offended, therefore he is personally angry with sinners. And it's not just mankind in general, but each sinner in particular. Just like God knows everything about that person, as if he's the only one that exists. In the same way, God is angry with each sinner as if he was the only sinner in the universe. And that includes us. Now, people will object to this. Even theologians, preachers will object to this. And here are just a few of their objections. They'll say, well, hold on. God is angry, but he's angry at sin, not the sinner. You've heard the little phrase, God hates the sin, but not the sinner. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God hates all workers of iniquity. Sin is not some amorphous thing out there. And God says, well, I hate that. Sin doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in us. Just like you can't have color by itself. Color exists in a thing. God just doesn't hate sin out there. God is angry with sinners. And it says there in Psalm 7, 11, continually, God is angry with the wicked every day. Continually. Even on your best days. Think of those happy days. You get married. You, you, you win some prize, some contest, something, and you say, that was the happiest day of my life. For little Catholic children, it's their first communion. They get dressed up in white and hold a little flower or a white Bible or, or children, you know, some happy thing that happens to them. But if they're not Christians, even on their best days, God is angry with them. God is angry with us even when we sleep. It says God is angry with the wicked every day. That's today. He is more angry with you today than he was yesterday. But I can guarantee you he'll be more angry with you 
tomorrow than he is today and the next day after that because our sins are being stored up every day. In Psalm 79, 5, David asked, How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? And the answer comes back concerning sinners. Yes, God will be angry forever on lost sinners because they will continue to live forever and ever. And in hell, it's increasingly exposed to the wrath of God like momentum that's snowballing because even in hell, sinners still sin and therefore the wrath of God increases for all eternity. Can you imagine that? Compared to the anger now, forever and ever. Second objection. And I've heard this with my own ears. People say, my God is a God of love. God's not angry with anything or anybody. Not this wrath idea. As you know, for years, I've been answering letters from prison inmates, and there's one down in Australia that writes me about every two months. I guess he's been writing for about five years now. And he keeps bringing this up. He says, I believe in God just like you do. I believe in Jesus, but I believe God is everybody's father. God loves everybody. And God's not angry with anything or anybody. And I've tried to convince him, saying, isn't God angry with what, with war and disease and, and things like that and crime? And he says, oh, no, no, God's not angry. And I had to tell him, your God is not the true God. You're worshiping an idol. And if that's the case with anybody here that says, well, God's not angry, not with me. You're worshiping an idol of your own imagination as much as some pagan that chops up a log and carves it and worships it. You have made an idol of your own imagination in your own image. But the God of the Bible, the true God, is a God of wrath and anger. Wrath is as essential to God as his holiness, love or wisdom, and we cannot reject it. Yes, God is a God of love and of wrath. Third objection. They say, well, you know, when I read the Bible... I find all this wrath and anger in the Old Testament, not the New Testament. So that's the Old Testament God of wrath, not the New Testament God of love. That shows they don't know the Bible or they're twisting it for their own destruction. First, God never changes. It's the same God. And there's love and wrath in both Testaments. John 3.36 is in the New Testament where it says the wrath of God abides on him. Romans 2 is in the New Testament. We find John the Baptist talking about the wrath of God. Paul the Apostle, Peter, John, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. Number four. This is one put forth by Richard Dawkins, the English atheists, and others. They say, well, this idea of the wrath of God, that's left over from ancient Jewish mythology that they borrowed from the pagans. And it's just the same thing. You read the Greeks and the Romans and the Babylonians. They have all these gods that are angry with each other. And they say, you know, that's what the Hebrew God is like. No. Pagan gods were selfish, malicious, capricious, petty. And their poor people never knew when, you know, uh, Zeus or Hercules is going to throw thunderbolts. And they said, well, I didn't deserve it. No, God is not like that. And read the Bible and you'll see it. Now, perhaps. Perhaps this um, tribal warfare of pagan gods is simply a reflection of what's going on in the realm of the demons. Demons are behind pagan gods and goddesses, and demons hate each other, and perhaps this is spilling over into pagan religions, including Islam. Allah is a pagan god. But the true god is not like them. Those are false gods. The true god has... True wrath, holy wrath. Number five, some people say this idea of the wrath of God, that, that's unworthy of God. No, it is most worthy of God. God has a right to be angry. Lastly, number six, I've even heard and read people say, well, yes, there is this anger in God, but it's like in us. You know, we've got a good side, but we all have some weakness, some some bad side. You know, it might be that you lose your temper, you, you get greedy or, or whatever. And they say it's kind of like that. And they dared call this the dark side of God. That is blasphemy. First John 1 John 1.5 says God is light and in him is no darkness whatsoever. The wrath of God is not darkness. It's his holy holiness being shown out in light. 
Now, these are just a few of the objections, but let, let's cut to the heart of the matter. Why do sinful people deny this and hate this? It's because deep down they know it is true. Romans 1.18 says God has convinced them and they don't like it. They don't like the holiness of God. They certainly don't want to experience His wrath. So they deny it, they twist it, or they shift it off some other way, which proves they've never grasped God's holiness or their own sin. Sin wrath doesn't seem real to them. So they laugh at this. They make jokes about this. I saw this on my trip to England recently when I went out to Speaker's Corner. That's a part of Hyde Park in the middle of London where on a Sunday afternoon all sorts of religious and political people go out there, stand on a ladder or a chair, and they talk to people and they preach and answer questions. And I was out there and I saw this precious Chinese brother preaching, telling them about the love of God and about sin, and the crowd was laughing at him and cursing and making fun of him. Every time he mentioned God, they would laugh. And he said, don't you know God is holy? And they laughed. He said, don't you know God is loving? Don't you know God is holy? And they laughed at that. And every now and then I'd say, keep preaching it, brother. Keep preaching it. I'm with you. But that's the way people are. They laugh at that. They laugh at it. The Bible says sinners mock holiness. But I would warn them and anybody in this congregation, laugh now while you can because there's no laughing in hell. He that laughs last laughs best. Jesus Christ himself said, those that laugh now will one day weep. So people make fun of it now. Now, Romans 1 says that through nature God has revealed his wrath, but he's revealed it in various other ways such as in the Lord Jesus Christ. He displayed the wrath of God just like he displays all the other holiness, the holy attributes of God. And on at least three occasions we see it in the Gospels. I say at least three because there were probably other ones that are not recorded. Number one, Mark 3, 5. Jesus in the, uh, in the synagogue and he sees this poor man that has a, 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 a wrist or a, a withered hand, it says, and Jesus is about to heal him on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders saying, this isn't right. And it says Jesus was angry at them because of their hardness and sensitive hearts. They wouldn't have mercy on this poor man. Don't you ever feel a kind of righteous anger at those that hurt people without pity? Jesus did. Then secondly, in Mark ten fourteen, it says that parents were bringing their little children for Jesus to bless them. And the apostles were saying, no, 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 keep them away. And it says Jesus was angry, not with the parents, not with the children, but with the apostles. So it says Jesus was angry and says, let them bring the little children here. Don't you get angry when you hear about something terrible done to a little child? Don't you rage with a holy indignation whenever you hear about abortion? Well, how about the other end of the age spectrum when you hear about something done to some elderly person? Doesn't that cause you anger? It does to God. It did to Jesus. And then thirdly, we see when Jesus went into the holy temple of God and he saw people making money off of it. And it says that he was angry and drove them out with a whip, drove the money changers out. And then in Matthew 23, seven times he called down God's curse upon the religious leaders. Yes, Jesus showed the anger and wrath of God. Now, there are many other examples of this in the Bible. Let me call your attention to the most prominent one back in the Old Testament. It's found early on in human history, the flood. That it says that sin was out of control, it was like a raging forest fire, and people were doing all sorts of despicable things, and God says, that's it. And so he, he warned them, he says, I'm going to send a flood, Noah, build the ark, invite people to repent and come on. You know, we, 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 we kind of downplay that when we, you know, tell Sunday school stories to children and we talk about it. We say, yeah, it's a nice little story. The animals all came dancing onto the ark and all this. And it was kind of nice. They missed the point. Why did God send the flood? It was an expression of his anger against the whole world and only eight people survived. And every drop that came from heaven was saying the wrath of God and people were drowning. Friends, there were no bumper stickers on the ark of God saying, smile, God loves you. They were experiencing the wrath of God as they died. Picture it. 
Water from above. The Bible says water from beneath. And of course, it came down so quickly. People were scrambling for cover, climbing trees, houses, lifting up babies. But it came so quickly, they all drowned very quickly. Except for only eight people that believed God's warning and got on the ark. Everyone else suffered the wrath of God. Have you ever wondered what no one in his family thought when all that was happening, when they were on the ark, safe and sound? Maybe they heard people out there screaming, but they heard rain come on top of it, just pounding, pounding, pounding in the thunder. And then the boat began to rise. I'll tell you what they were thinking. They were grateful they were in the ark and not outside. And I would imagine that no one in his family got on their knees and said, Lord, Thank you that you warned us and thank you you gave us the faith to believe in you. Thank you, Lord. And then the rain came and everybody else outside died and then eventually the rain stopped and then the ark would be just floating all alone. The Bible says that there was a window. Later he would release a couple of birds through it, but I imagine Noah would go out and look through that, out through the window and you know what he would see? Dead bodies floating. And I don't mean just animals. He'd see people, an old man, a young child, a mother, just bodies floating. And he'd say, that's the wrath of God. They deserved it. Perhaps every now and then when Noah was with with his family, and there was no more rain, maybe they heard a little bit of a wind blowing, and then from time to time they'd hear a thump up against the ark. And the boys would say, Father, what's that? The sound of another one of those bodies bumping into the ark. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Noah said, I warned them for years. And he'd grab his son's shrimp. I warned them. Yes, Daddy, you did. I heard you. Japheth, I warned them and they didn't listen. Now that they're all dead under the wrath of God, yes, you warned them. And I'm warning you of the wrath of God. Jesus said that there will be another flood coming one day, not of water, but of fire. And I am warning everybody here within earshot of the wrath of God to come. God said that the flood was, a, as it were, a forebearer of another wrath to come. It will come in fire. Then there are other examples like Sodom and Gomorrah, which we mentioned last week. It's very interesting about Sodom and Gomorrah. God gave that land to Abraham hundreds of years earlier. And it says, now, Abraham, when you go in, just wait. The wrath of the Amorites, that's the Canaanites, is not yet full. As if to say, they're very sinful. And they're going to be punished one day. I'm going to do something very special on them as an example. But it hasn't reached a certain level yet like it did in the days of Noah. Our friend Richard Owen Roberts has written a Serious article on this that we have in the lobby called The Legal Limit on Sin. Because the Bible says that it's like each one of us has been given a cup. And when it's filled to the very top, then God's wrath falls upon us. But we have different sized cups. First Thessalonians 2.16, talking about the Jews that were resisting the gospel and had crucified Christ. Paul says, they are always filling up the measure of their sins, but... Wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. And that's what happened in A.D. 70 when the Romans came in and killed probably close to a million Jews. The wrath came because they had been storing it up. And that's what we're doing. We're storing it up. Drop by drop, that cup is being filled up. Would it change the metaphor? It's like a very long fuse. It's been lit to the dynamite. And some people have a longer fuse than others. But none of us know how long it will be. None of us will know when that cup is filled and God says, enough! It's time to suffer the wrath of God. And sometimes He pours it out in this life, or He takes a person's life and takes them into the next world to suffer it. It varies from person to person. And then one day, the Bible says it will be the day of wrath. Romans 2.12 and other verses. Turn with me to two places in the book of Revelation on this. First chapter 6. Jesus showed us some of the wrath of God when he was on earth. But the Bible says he will show more of it at his second coming. Read about it in 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1, but here in Revelation 6 is talking about when Jesus is coming and the sky is rolled back like a curtain or like a scroll, verse 14, and every mountain and island is now moving out of its place as God's wrath is beginning to come forth. And it says here, all these people on earth, even the kings of the earth, the presidents, the Bill Gates, the high and the mighty, the celebrities, what are they doing? They're running for cover. They're hiding themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. Rather to be buried alive with breathing in loadfuls of earth, then what, what is terrifying them? It says in verse 16, they're calling to the mountains to fall on them, to hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's Jesus Christ. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand... People are not going to laugh at Jesus at the second coming. They're going to be terrified. They're going to be on their faces, trembling as they look up and see the Lord Jesus Christ coming, displaying the wrath of God. There'll be no place to run. Now, that's from human point of view. Let's look at it more from God's point of view. Turn to Revelation 19. Again, some more very vivid illustrations that God himself gives us. Here again, it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Eight eyes like a flame of fire, verse 12. These different names written upon himself. Verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And then the armies of heaven are coming with him, verse 15, uh, verse 14. Verse 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, meaning everybody. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. What's this about his robe dipped in blood? Some people will look at that and I say, that's right. Jesus died. He shed blood for us. No, that's not at all what the Bible is saying. It's not his blood. It's the blood of his enemies. Let me read you some verses that are, this is alluding to back in Isaiah 63. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I have trodden them in my anger, and I trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes, for the day of vengeance is in my heart. It's like the idea of, in the old days, trampling the grapes to make wine. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he comes in fury and says, he treads out the winepress in his anger. And it's like some of the juice squirts up upon him. Or to change the metaphor, it's like when a butcher, you ever see a butcher and he has blood all over his, his apron. Years ago, I used to go deer hunting back in Texas and I'd have to field dress it, hang it up, cut it open and... You know, I, there were times I had blood all the way up past my elbows, and I was looking to be all over my clothes. Sometimes I had to throw it away. That's a picture of what happens at the second coming of Christ. It's earthy, I know that. But it helps get us in the gut as if to say, you are going to be slaughtered, and your blood is going to be upon his robe as he shows his white, hot anger against us. And then there's the judgment day. And then hell fire, the final and ultimate place where God vents his wrath. God created hell as the place where he will express his holy wrath on his enemies. Not one day, not a thousand, but forever. And what will be his attitude? It will be pure wrath. Now it is tempered in mercy. Not on that day. It says in Revelation 14, it, the wine will be poured out unmixed. Nothing to dilute it. And what will God's attitude be? No more mercy, no more temper, no more offer of kindness. Listen to this, Revel, uh, Ezekiel 8, 18. Therefore, I will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. Though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. And they will cry out with a loud voice in hell. And it's as if God says, I'm not listening to your cries. I am busy pouring out wrath upon your sins. You deserve this. And the Bible, again, uses the metaphor of, of People being made to drink the cup of God's wrath has been stored up for them drop by drop. Every sin, the cup gets bigger more and more. And then God says, now the time has come. You're going to have to drink of the wrath of God. For every sin, another drop of divine anger and torment in hell. But unlike earthly wine, it's no delicious taste. 
but rather intoxicated on the wrath of God that does not taste good. It's more like acid. Revelation 14.10, They shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without measure into the cup of his indignation. Now someone today might say, Okay, you think you can scare me? Not me. I'm going to resist that. Even if God does come with me, I just won't open my mouth. God is totally able to make you drink. There's a verse in the Old Testament where it says, you think you will not drink, and God says, you will drink it. God is stronger than you, and God is perfectly able to make you experience His wrath. It's irresistible. Romans 9.23 says, lost sinners are vessels of wrath. They're filled up. The wrath of God itself will be drunken down. That means it's internalized. Lost sinners in hell experience the hot and holy wrath of God in their very beings. Their body, their soul, everything about them will be aflame with the wrath of God. And there's more. Ezekiel 38.18 says, my fury will show in my face. Brethren, if the highest joy of heaven is seeing God's face in love and glory, then perhaps the most painful part of hell will be to look up and see the anger written on God's face. Revelation 6, they were saying, hide us from the face of him that comes out of heaven. And there's more. Not just that they see his face, but they hear his voice. Some of these very verses today, I've tried to capture the... The import of them. Can you hear the voice of God now warning you through those? Imagine what it will be like on the day when there will be no offers of hope and God will speak in His wrath. Just imagine the tone of that and the volume of that. We've all trembled when we hear someone really angry. Nothing compared with God. And the wrath of God cannot be pacified or appeased by anything we do. There are people that say, you're right, preacher, I believe in this. Oh, you've got me to thinking about this. I hope I don't have nightmares. And so people then say, well, I guess that if I start doing something good, then that will pacify God or appease God. And so people say, I'll go to church. I'll read my Bible. I'll do anything. They get desperate sometimes. I'll do anything to make God not angry at me. But I would remind you, there is nothing you can do that can stop God from being angry at you because everything you do is sin in God's sight. And it only increases your wrath. Every time you do good deeds, that makes God more angry as if He says, you think you can appease my wrath with that? You've got another thought coming. So not your good deeds, joining a church, baptism, nothing. Not even in hell will God's wrath be appeased for all eternity. Not even your groans and experiencing it. Not ever anything we can ever do. Does that mean there is no hope? There's no hope in hell. But we're not there yet. Is there hope on this side of hell? Yes. This is where the good news comes in. This is what makes it good News. There is hope. Only one way. Jesus Christ. The Bible uses a word for what he did that appeased the wrath of God for his people. It's called propitiation. It's in Romans. It's in Hebrews. It's in 1 John. What does that word mean? It means the sacrifice by blood, suffering, and death that appeases or pacifies the anger of God. The animal sacrifices in the Old Testament were to be a picture of this. Jesus was the final sacrifice. Now, it's provided by God. It's not the Son, as it were, calming down His Father. No, the Father provided this in love. In God's love and His grace, He has provided propitiation through the death of Jesus. Whereby God says, I accept it. The, the Son says, it's finished. And the Father says, I'm satisfied. My wrath for my people is now appeased. It's been spent, all of it, spent upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who in those six hours on the cross experienced more of the wrath of God than we will experience or that all of us will experience in hell. He experienced it. He took the cup of God's wrath and he drank it down to the very last drop and said, it is finished. And it was finished, thank God. And the result is that when a sinner truly repents and believes in Jesus Christ, 
He is safe from the wrath of God. You know, we talk about salvation, being safe. Safe from what? Well, safe from loneliness, safe from sin, death, hell. Has it ever occurred to you what we're really safe from? We are finally and forever safe from the wrath of God. God saves us, as it were, from Himself. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, When Jesus comes, it says, Jesus delivered us from the wrath to come. What should we do? Be grateful, be humble. Like Noah on the earth, brethren, in the light of God's wrath, we should get on our faces and say, Lord, thank You that Jesus died. Thank You that He took Your wrath from me. I didn't deserve it. I deserve hell. Thank You, thank You, thank You. And Christians will spend eternity kissing the feet of Jesus in gratitude for Him taking the wrath of God for us. And it should move us to worship. Isaiah 12, 1 and 2 says, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Christians are no longer under the wrath of God. Two applications. Number one. Unbelievers are still under the wrath of God. And that should cause them to fear God and repent of their sins. Some people will say, frighten a person into repentance. Maybe not. But it can sometimes get their attention and get them started. Maybe God's giving us a providential hint even now. Unbelievers should be caused to repent to God. But you see, when we are afraid of like anger, we want to run from that. A dog chases us, it's growling, we want to run from it. And so people will hear this message and they say, Oh, I'm not going to stop going to church all this wrath of God. That's the worst thing that you could ever do. Instead of running from God, run to God. It asks for mercy. You see, he is still tempering it and saying, I'm warning you and I'm inviting you. While there is still time, there is still hope. You can't outrun his wrath. Where are you running to? Are you running from God? If you are running from God, you are running straight to hell. Turn around. That's repentance. And turn back to God and say, Lord, forgive me. I deserve wrath. Forgive me because of Jesus. And secondly, fellow Christians, we are not under the wrath of God anymore. Let us. Warn those that are under the wrath of God. John the Baptist said to the Pharisees, Who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Brethren, who warned you? Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher or a parent that loved you enough to tell you this message. I love all of you here enough to tell you and to warn you. Thank God for that person. And go and thank that person that loved you enough to warn you about hell and the wrath of God. But a lot of Christians don't. We get nervous. What are they going to think of me? We had a story years ago, and I think it was in the life of John Wesley. I'm not sure. In those days, when a convicted, condemned criminal was being led out to the gallows, they'd take him in a certain wagon and put a preacher in there to pray for him and warn him and get him prepared to meet God. Well, on this occasion, there are some... A uh, very ungodly guy that had never gone to church, never read the Bible. The only time he used God's name was when he cursed. And there he's going in the wagon to face the gallows to be hanged. And the preacher was praying for him and reading a few things from the Bible and says, well, you need to be prepared for God. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll spit in his face. And he says, no, no, according to the Bible. And the preacher was trembling. He says, you're going to be facing God in his anger. And you think this judgment is bad. Oh, you're going to be punished at the judgment day and you'll go to hell. And he said, What? Oh, hell, there'll be eternal fire for your sins. He says, what? Nobody ever told me that. And he grabbed the preacher and shook him. He says, why didn't anybody tell me I'm about to die and go to hell? And nobody ever told me. Why didn't anybody warn me? And he was hanging because he was so limp. He could all, all he could say is, why didn't anybody tell me? And he they pulled the rope and he died and he faced God. Why don't we warn people that are dying every day? Our friends, our neighbors, our workmates. Pray for opportunities to warn them and invite them into the ark of safety by believing in Jesus Christ. Brethren, may God cause these words to sink deep into all of our hearts today, lest we forget them, 
or ignore them. In God's name, amen. Let us pray. Father, even the thunder and lightning reminds us of your wrath. We see it in Jesus. We saw it in the flood. We hear it in your word. Open our eyes and our hearts to know it is true. And while you open our hearts, give us faith and repentance to believe, to turn from our sins and to turn to you. We pray for those that are under your wrath and facing your wrath. We pray that you would save them. And Father, we that have been saved, we thank you so much that you saved us. When we were running from you, you chased us down, you turned us around. Jesus died for us and you saved us from your wrath. Father, we say thank you and we praise your holy name forever. In the name of Jesus. Oh, man.